Hello and welcome everyone to our panel, What is the IQ of your company? Measure, develop, apply, evolve, repeat. My name is Ralph Hurt and I'm the CEO of AW8 Global Business Builders, providing the CoffQ platform to empower companies to grow and create value on an ongoing basis, also known as the Compound Value Creator Quotient. This week we released CoffQ Tech Insights report for those interested in it. You can read it on the Horace's website. One of the key takeaways from it is that there's a lack of cohesiveness and systematic approaches supported by underlying knowledge and technology infrastructure. Today, we therefore want to better understand how smart companies actually are and how they can develop their intelligence systematically. I found it really interesting that companies are not regularly being assessed in a best practice manner and that there are no standards in place. It seems we are all reinventing the wheel over and over again. We look into developing people all the time. The number of different personality tests is in the four digits and have been used for more than 100 years. The Myers-Briggs personality test has been taken 60 million times. But for companies, we only look at our rational KPI dashboards that show us the most recent status, but not really what has led to get us there and how to improve everything as early in the process as possible. I'm extremely delighted to have some fantastic and accomplished panelists here today who in fact have seen it all. We have with us uh, David Siegel, who is the CEO of MeetApp, ran Seeking Alpha and Investopedia before. He's also a management professor at Columbia University. David is the author of Decide and Conquer, 44 Decisions That Will Make or Break All Leaders, which will actually be released next week. John Kötzier, who is a senior contributor at Forbes, True Mobile Economist, podcast host of Tech First and Mobile Heroes, and interviewed a great deal of business leaders. He's currently writing the book Insights from the Future. Needless to say that, of course, he has got his own crypto creator coin smart. Katja Kempe is the CEO and founder of Viveka. Viveka is a platform for coaches and integrated SaaS solution for companies to develop their employees. Katja was awarded Female Entrepreneur of the Year Asia, of the year, Asia Pacific and came in 12 spots behind Elon Musk in the ranking of top founders to change the way we do business in 2021 by Yahoo Finance. No pressure. Matt Bloomberg, CNO and founder of Bolsa, a new talent marketplace for on-demand executives. Matt was also the founder, chairman and CEO of Frequently Awarded Return Pass, which was acquired by Validity. Matt is the author of Startup CEO, Startup CXO, and Startup Boards, which, by the way, are all really terrific. Last but not least, uh, we are going to have, hopefully very soon, Naomi Kent, who is uh, joining us, who serves as the president of North America at InTouch, which brings together executives and board members, as well as provide services to develop all of their qualities. So uh, I hope Naomi can join us any minute. Um, let me just go ahead maybe uh, with Matt. And Matt, you built Return Pass for two decades, and I believe many of your learnings didn't only make it into your books, but also into the bolster business and, and platform you founded. I would love to know what you think is most challenging when scaling up and developing and instrumentalizing a company's qualities with this in mind. Yeah, I think the... Um, uh, the, the the challenge with um, learning loops in general um, isn't isn't doing learning. Um, I mean, I guess that's the baseline hurdle, right? You have to be committed to learning. But the real challenge is to institutionalize those learnings uh, and, um, you know, to make sure that they, they find their way, not just to the back of your brain or the person who's in the loop it is, but that they actually find their way into the fabric of the organization. And... Um, you know, what's been interesting um, with us, it, it, so Bolster is a new company. It's, we're not even two years old yet. Um, we have eight founders, um, which uh, is- started before uh, or uh, during the pandemic? Started right at the beginning of the pandemic, April right. uh, of 2020. Um, and uh, all of our founders uh, came from Return Path and had been working there for uh, anywhere from five to 20 years. So uh, we had, you know, sort of a, a, a dual challenge that we took on from the beginning. One was to figure out how to take our learnings from 20 years of scaling a business to 500 people and global footprint and 100 million in revenue and actually turn that, bring that to the new business. Um, and then we also had a challenge based on what our business is of 
trying to bring those learnings to the startup ecosystem itself. So um, when it came to our own business, uh, we really set out to uh, institutionalize learnings and turn them into frameworks that we could publish, uh, that we could kind of brand internally uh, and uh, could make it easy for employees, particularly new people that hadn't worked with us at our prior company to understand, you know, sort of how we wanted to do things and why. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for example, we had a, a really good process at our prior company of kind of kicking off the year and defining our goals and talking about the mission of the company and the values of the company. But that, that we never had a name for that. We just did it every year and we were used to doing it every year. Um, now it is our operating framework. Our operating framework at this company has a brand, which is Bolster, um, which is all caps and each letter means a different thing. Uh, and uh, we publish that to the company and we share it on a Trello board. And it's now sort of there's, there's a way we do it. There's a, you know, a thing we do, it's sort of systematized. Um, you know, similarly, we uh, did a lot of work at our prior company on team retrospectives uh, and, you know, not just doing them on the engineering team after a sprint or a release, but every team doing retrospectives on some, you know, regular cadence that made sense for, um, you know, for, for whatever that team's was and its, its own operating rhythm. Well, that's now actually kind of built into our uh, to our operating system at Bolster. And, you know, there are triggers that come up every quarter or every half quarter and or every month, depending on the team. Um, and we have a place to actually record the learnings from those, um, you know, from those retrospectives. So um, we've done a lot to sort of take um, the kind of um, the tribal knowledge and turn it into, into real system and process. Uh, so that's sort of one end of the challenge. The second end of the challenge is, um, uh, is amplifying that throughout the startup ecosystem. So Bolster's business is, as you said in the introduction, we're a talent marketplace. We connect founders and CEOs of startups and scale-ups with seasoned executives for anything from board roles, full-time roles, but a lot of like coach, mentor, advisor, uh, freelance, uh, fractional interim executive type roles as well. And we work extensively with companies that are very, very uh, early in their in their life, sort of companies that are less than three years old. We also work with larger companies, but we have a, a good number of companies that are very early stage. So we've, we've done um, a lot of work to, uh, to build a curriculum of learning for those companies into our platform um, so that, you know, they can engage with mentors and coaches and understand how to build some things like, what is a company operating system? What are the elements of it? Why should you care about it? Um, you know, and, and what are some models to go off of? Um, so uh, we, we try to um, take our own medicine, but also make sure that we're we're spreading it to the world of startups. Okay, that's really uh, fascinating. Just one uh, quick question. So what does Bolster then uh, stand for each of the letters? <laughs> each of the letters, you're gonna test me to see if I remember them. So oh, yeah, B, sorry B is the big idea. Um, so that's sort of, uh, you know, you would call that like our purpose statement. Um, o is operating principles. So those are our values. L is long-term strategy. So that's sort of, you know, what we do. Um, uh, S is uh, strategy for winning. So that's sort of the competitive game plan. Uh, T is the theme for the year. So what is 2022 all about? Uh, e is... Uh, e was the only one that was a little hard to fit in the framework. So E is endeavors and outcomes. So that is uh, sort of strategic initiatives, OKRs. Uh, and then R is responsibilities. So who's in charge of what? Okay, awesome. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but that was a great I'm, I'm glad I got it. I'm glad I got it all. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, welcome, Naomi. Uh, glad uh, you could make it. I introduced you already, actually. And um, yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, you and uh, your work at uh, InTouch Networks. Uh, you've been uh, working with many uh, different boards. Uh, can you share maybe uh, how most of them are assessing the status quo and making something meaningful out of it for the really uh, long term? And is this initial task actually already a headache for many? 
Yeah, thank you, Ralph, and apologies for being late here. Um, so thanks to the CovQ team for organizing this great discussion. So we're, we're a global tech ed business, and we support boards of directors that are in development, and then also individuals who are seeking out professional development through you know, board-related courses, coaching, or personal branding. Now, my discussion today, I really want to talk to how um, boards have delivered insights from the executive teams, um, how they work with that information, and how if there are any ways that we can start to improve that process. Um, for the sake of the session today, I know we have global um, people on the phone. I I'm sort of referring to the outside board directors, so the supervisory directors, the non-executives who, who sit on that board. Um, now, I work directly with the business leaders involved in deploying um, a number of initiatives across boards and executive teams. Um, I also consult on areas, and, and one of them is this sort of board report, right, which is, I think we call it the board pack, the board papers. Um, and it's, uh, it's primarily how boards gain insight into the businesses that they oversee um, so they can help make you know, strategic decisions, essentially, and, and grow these companies, transform them, uh, mitigate risk, with whichever option it might be. Now, what we tend to see is that smaller firms tend to be a little bit less sophisticated and they gather data from you know, different parts of the business. Maybe the data is not that great. Um, larger firms tend to do a better job at this. Um, but we still see a lot of gaps in um, the areas of reporting up to the board. Now, what we tend to see is that boards are not aligned. So one division will be delivering a report that is not coordinated with others. Um, boards can get frustrated. And actually, we've surveyed a lot of boards of directors, and we've found that there's three complaints that we hear consistently, which is inconsistent and inaccurate data that comes to them. Um, it's time consuming and an inefficient process to actually, you know, gain the information, ask questions. This information is not on hand. And then they also find there's a lack of transparency. That was the third one. And, and as a board director, when you you're abiding by your governance rules, um, this is, is definitely an area of concern for them. Um, another area that perhaps we can throw into the mix is when there's M&A activity. So um, boards are given minimal information or in some cases given inaccurate information about uh, businesses that they want to acquire or mergers that are going to take place. Um, and, and this can leave boards feeling quite um, uh, um, sort of sidelined, essentially, and in decision making that they're doing. Um, I think what boards want, and, and this is what we hear consistently across the group, they're looking for accurate competitive intelligence, competitive intelligence that's consistent across the company, um, and then quantifiable reporting. Um, so something that they can look at and compare over time, something that's consistent, um, and something that really can they can get and they can understand. Um, just by chance, yesterday I was actually talking to a, a CHRO and um, she told me that she reports into the board and she's really struggling with the types of reporting that she needs to do. Um, and we discussed sort of what are some of the areas that she can look at, that she can quantify. And it, and it can in some cases, especially in certain types of companies that are rapidly growing. You know, you've just, I don't know, brought on 700 employees in two years. Um it can be a challenge uh, to really understand um, how the business is performing. And so I think at the board level, you know, my, my, personal, um, my, my personal goal and, and, and challenge that I face every day is working with companies that are saying they just don't have the information that they need in the format that they need it. Um, so it's definitely a data issue. It's a, a consistency issue. And like I said, it does affect the smaller to medium sized companies. However, you'd be surprised at some of the larger companies that are just not able to do this either. So I hope that helps to sort of start this this kind of from maybe right at the top. Yeah, that's uh, great. Actually, uh, I was just thinking about this, you know, actually sort of the more traditional um, companies, I guess, better set up or that versus, I guess, fast growing growth companies. But you're saying it's not really the case, actually. Not necessarily. No, it doesn't always fit into that that mold. Um, I, I I think where where boards get frustrated the most is where it impacts their decision making. Um, you know, there are governance laws and rules, and they want to abide by them. But when they're given inaccurate information or when they're pointed in the wrong direction, um, that that can have a negative impact. So I, I think it's more that 
Um, obviously, they're looking out for the shareholders and the stakeholders and doing the right thing. Um, but it's important that they have the executive teams behind them, supporting them in the right way. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Katja, uh, curious to know, uh, why did you found Viveka and uh, why, uh, and, and um, what, what are sort of the interesting uh, data points that you can share uh, from the world of developing uh, people that ultimately develop companies? Absolutely. Thank you, Ralph. It's great to be here. Um, so Viveka is an end-to-end -end learning experience platform. What does that mean? We deploy coaches, online coaches and trainers to companies and provide the companies with the software to execute, administer, and most importantly, what we're talking about, measure or the training. So we founded Viveka in the belief that there's a better way to train people, and that is to transform them. Um, and Ralph, you picked such a great topic for today's conversation, you know, measuring the IQ of a company. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's a really complex and evolving topic, I think. Unprecedented levels of uncertainty. Old paradigms are, you know, really making way to the new ways of measuring uh, people's performance, the development of them. And the KPIs that we used to look at in the past, just merely looking at performance and revenue and profitability, they just don't really cut it anymore. So um, that's one thing that we're dedicated to with Viveka. And uh, the way we do that is by a dashboard that really measures everything from participation to improvement and gives boards, like Naomi said, what they struggle with most, the data points to look into how employees are uh, evolving and how are they adapting. And I think the new age of a company's IQ is really measured by the ability of a company to respond to ever-changing market conditions. And not only the ability of a company to respond, but how agile can it be in the process and what quality response does it deliver? So what do we mean with that? We mean, you know, what is a company's ability to respond to a crisis um, and, and more than just responding to it, how can it seize it as an opportunity or how quickly can leadership team pivot based on the data points that it receives um, when restrictions are enforced or when new requirements are, are given to employees or new product developments are, are innovated? And how well does a company engage its workforce to adapt to these new processes? And if you look at the construct of a company, The IQ really depends on the individual components of the company, meaning its employees. So the sum of the IQ of the employees really gives the uh, accumulative IQ of the company, in our opinion. Um, that's why we think training is so uh, important nowadays, especially when we're looking at so much uh, resignation, attrition rates at highest levels that we've ever seen before, 25%. I mean, that's a staggering 4% of workers leaving per month. Um, you know, Amazon just lost 30% of their employees last year. Uh, these are real concerns that boardrooms are battling with, and um, they are, as um, Matt and Naomi said, you know, they're, they're, they need not only the engagement of their employees and the motivation, but more importantly, also the data to reliably make executive decisions. Oh, wow. A lot of information in here. I, I think I can summarize that, that we may uh, look at the dashboards from yesterday as opposed to from having, I guess, a preview where the business uh, is heading. Uh, John, uh, where to start with all the activities that you have uh, going on? You've been interviewing so many business leaders in your shows. Did you come across many actually trying to understand their company's IQ or create some sort of similar concepts and uh, related strategies to evolve on an ongoing basis? That's a really simple answer. Um, no, <laughs> I think. All right, then, uh, David. <laughs> no, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> there is oh, more sorry. story there. Sorry. Uh, but I, I do mostly talk to early stage companies. I mean, I do talk, I have talked to Nathan Mirvold, who was a CTO of Microsoft and interviewed him, others and Mark Cuban and others like that as well. So there's some big companies, but mostly early stage, right? And so most founders there, especially they have a vision, they're super passionate about it. They want to pursue that. They want to take that somewhere. 
And as a startup founder, you kind of have to have the blinders on, right? You kind of have to ignore your probability of success is minimal, right? (laughs) So as a startup founder, you kind of have to ignore a lot of stuff. You pursue your vision. A lot of people, this is not a shock, uh, who start companies don't really have the ability to operationalize them, right? Or sometimes you bring on pure operators and process people who can make the wheels turn, but they didn't have the direction or the, or the passion or the focus. What is interesting about what you've been talking about, Ralph, is I haven't really found kind of a business operating system that you could generalize to multiple businesses, you know, personalize where needed, right? And drive to success. I guess uh, McDonald's maybe (laughs) and other franchises are a little bit different. But when we're talking technology and startups and, you know, individual businesses, um, it's it's a different matter. And I mean, honestly, I'm really bad at that sort of thing. I've raised some millions for a Series A. I raised an angel round for a blockchain metaverse company. That was three years ago, by the way. Three years ago, Metaverse was thinking about it, but, um, but you know, Timing I really, is important. <laughs> what's that? Sorry, Ralph. Timing is important. Yes, it is. It's not good either, you know? <laughs> yes, it is. But I pretty much suck at managing people um, and processes, right? So, so now I'm pretty much a solo operator, investor and consultant, but happy to be on the panel and one note if we're not talking we should probably mute because there's some horrific background noise and somebody moves i i don't know who it is uh, no fingers here but we should probably mute ourselves when we're not talking okay uh thank you very much john i, I thought it interesting you know that you point out that uh startup founders uh have a very like uh, low likelihood of succeeding and the reality is that's probably or it's true and However, they actually don't know that in most cases. <laughs> um, uh, David, um, yeah, uh, all right. Running Meetup during the pandemic, spinning it out of WeWork into Kevin Ryan's Alicorp umbrella at the peak of it in April 2020. Sounds like extremely challenging times. I'm sure your company needs a high IQ to be delivering all the mission critical priorities in such phases of change. How have you been doing it and measuring and evolving it? You know, like like you said, um, what did Meetup do when you couldn't meet up when the pandemic started? You know, that's not a good thing when your name is actually Meetup and everything is IRL, everything is in person, and you have to transition from everything in person to everything online very quickly. Um, so just to, as a first part, we basically, uh, the number one reason why we didn't accept, so for people who don't know Meetup, Meetup is the world's largest platform for building and uh, finding community. We have... We have 57 million members and we have 300,000 different groups in 193 different countries, every country, but I think North Korea, there's a meetup group in. So uh, when we couldn't meet up in person, we um, got all of our engineers together and we said, what's our mission? We grounded everything back to our mission. And we said, is our mission IRL? Like is our mission of our company about in real life or is a mission of our company, you know, all about building connections and connecting people to each other and through those connections, great potential things happen. People find jobs, people find mates, people find all the great things in life. And the answer was, it's not about IRL, it's about connections. So since the pandemic, we've had, we went from zero in our first uh, 18 years of existence to over 5 million online events just in the last couple of years. So that's a quick overview. And then in terms of how we did it, we're really governed by our, our core values. Um, we do an engagement survey uh, four times a year. And the organizing principle in our engagement survey, our employee engagement survey, is around our six core values. So just very quickly, our six core values, um, some of them were mentioned already by others. But number one is trust and transparency. Understand the best way to build trust for people is through being highly transparent, sharing your financial, sharing your board deck, sharing everything with the organization, trust and transparency. And we did that when Meetup was having, um, you know, potentially going to go under. Um, he said, hey, we got to do something quickly because we're losing a lot of money because we were just under WeWork. We just got sold to Alicorp and the pandemic hit all at the same time. Hence, it made for like a, a good potential book. Yay. Well, they're there. Yay. So anyway, uh, but anyway, trust and transparency is one. The second is called focus on impact, which is the more that you, the best impact you can have is by focusing, not being all over the place like I am right now and talking. The third is inviting change, not just like letting change happen, but inviting change. And that's a really important value for us that we, that we, 
that we measure and we and we look at in, in terms of different groups and as an organization. Because if people are resistant to change, it's going to be really a problem to work at a company like Meetup that just left WeWork and has all these other interesting things happening. The last three, without going into too much detail, so I don't take up you know everyone's valuable time, is stepping up, not seeing that your role is just defined, but is you could take do more, and not seeing your job description is limiting, but 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 expansive. Um, number five is elevate people. Everything happens through people. And last is leading with integrity. And we put that, our recruiting is based on our values. Our performance reviews are based on our values. Our promotions are based on our values. Everything based on our values. And our decisions are ultimately based on our values as well. And that enabled us to be able to really have a $20 million profit improvement during the pandemic than before the pandemic. So that's, you know, um, a good thing. Yeah, that sounds like a great uh, accomplishment. So are you saying that uh, really in, in real life, it's more about the uh, soft qualities um, that ultimately ignite the successes? Yeah, what, what, what I really definitely always, always believe that emotional intelligence is far more important than like analytical intelligence. People's ability to lead, people's ability to motivate, people's ability to collaborate, you know, are far, far more important than, than you know, pure analytical rigor. Uh, because best decisions ultimately get made through disagreement, through collaboration, and bad things happen. Smartest people could be in like you have a passive aggressive type organization. So I think those traits are frankly instrumental to you know the success that we've had at Meetup and you know previous roles as well. And I used to work at Human Resources, as Ralph knows, back at DoubleClick yep. 20 plus years ago. So you know I'm a HR person at heart. Still an HR guy. <laughs> Still an HR guy at heart. CEO, HR, HR same thing. Katya like to hear that too. Um, it resonates very much uh, with what she's doing, right? Um, one point I also uh, took notes of, uh, maybe just uh, for anyone who wants wants to answer it. It just seems like there's uh, data everywhere. Uh, you could probably argue that many companies use too many tools with too little discipline and focus too much on call it maybe stuff as opposed to driving best of breed strategy execution. Uh, anyone wants to take this? Happy to have a stab at it, Ralph. <laughs> um, look, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, um, you know, we're all in this together. Um, it's a famous quote. And the thing is, pace of change is just increasing so dramatically quickly that even management teams and leadership boards are um, struggling to find the right tool. And the, the reality is the investment that they can make from a, from a time effort, if the tool isn't intuitive, most of the times the tools don't get used in an efficient, effective, responsible way. And not saying that the, that's the tool's fault, um, but quite frankly, a tool nowadays just has to be uh, convenient because of a lack of time from the leadership team. So um, what we're finding is that the more data you can crunch together in a platform, the more data you can utilize plugins for one management to have a dashboard and overview board, that's what they're really looking for. And I think that's what tech companies should be solving out there. So. What comes to my mind, Ralph, when you ask that question is that for most people in business that I have met and talked to, strategy is something you do in product, strategy is something you do in marketing, strategy is something you do in um, uh, buying other companies or market entries or whatever. And running the company is like, okay, turn the electricity on, <laughs> right? The gravity still works. The lights are on, right? We can do stuff. We can communicate. IT is there, right? We have all that stuff. And there isn't a ton of thought on what is the strategic underpinning of how you build a group of people who are going to change the world. And so I think that that is something that we don't... I don't probably, and many people don't naturally think of. And so I guess we need people like that in our organizations. I mean, yeah. focusing on mission is, is everything. It gives you just an unfair competitive advantage to the bottom line. You end up recruiting better people because you're focused on mission. And some people call it mission, noble cause, vision, whatever the heck you want to call it, it kind of matters less than just really understanding that that's what could differentiate the employee experience And, and it's not just talk, saying it, but like you have to really do it. You can't just like say things, but you have to invest money and make a decision. Say, hey, we might be losing some money in this specific thing here and we'll have less profit or less revenue in the short term because it's the right thing to do from a mission standpoint. And, and it's just uh, when employees see that, 
um, it, it makes an enormous difference in terms of retention and motivation. Totally agree. And I think this is a challenge in many companies that just focus too much on, I guess, functional strategies and, you know, if there are silos going on and it doesn't really, you know, come top down, it's more like happening in, in the middle. It doesn't need a car come uh, bottom up and maybe this is sort of uh, doing the trick, uh, connecting uh, those two. Uh, that also means in a way, you know, we need to uh, compound personal skills and strategy execution. And maybe uh, for, for Naomi and Matt, I mean, Matt, I, I did read two of your three books and there's so much information in it. So how, how do you then actually uh, bring this all, all together and, and, and translate it in, in real momentum? And any thoughts on this? Um. It sort of depends what level you're talking about in, in the organization. But, um, you know, I think the um, uh, our, our operating philosophy at, at both of our companies has always been, um, and, I, you know, I think it's probably true of, of um, you know, most of the audience here and certainly the panel, um, you know, we are knowledge economy businesses. We hire smart, capable people who are, you know, largely self-starters. Um, if they have uh, all of the information that they need to do their job, um, which is strategy and big picture and where, where the company is going, uh, dialing down to specific goals and objectives of the different pieces and parts of the organization, uh, competitive intelligence, operating metrics, financial metrics, they can make good decisions and largely self-manage. So we've always focused um, on building culture, uh, cultures of transparency and cultures of um, kind of information availability and information publicity uh, oh, yeah. so, that that, so that that information is um, is truly at people's fingertips. And um, one, one interesting experiment that we're running now, maybe it's not an experiment, uh, an interesting thing that we're, uh, we're doing at, the, uh, at, at Bolster, um, and we're still a relatively small company, we're 30 people right now, but I think this is something that may have the um, possibility of scaling as we grow is uh, we're doing a weekly all hands meeting that is what I would describe as a self-managed meeting. So uh, there's a Trello board with a little light um, integration with Slack and a couple of other things that, um, you know, we have 30 minutes with the whole company on Monday. Uh, we have um, a rotating chair of the meeting. So it's not, it's not like the old school all hands meeting where it's a, it's a quarter and it's a deck and I stand up in front of the company. Um, some of them I don't even, I, I don't even speak or I have a very minor part. Uh, mm. Someone chairs the meeting. At the end of it, they hand the, the baton to someone else to chair the next one. And that person is more moderating a discussion of like, what's everything everyone has put in, uh, you know, in the Trello board to look at. It's organized. There's a column on, um, you know, on, on values. So what happened this week that followed one of our values or that demonstrated one of our values that someone, you know, dropped a note in there. Uh, wins. So we're talking about client wins. Um, you know, each uh, department has like a rotation. So one week, each department gives an update. Um, our CFO will jump in uh, anytime there are monthly financials and publish them. Um, there's a metrics column, etc. So um, we're, we're really trying to push this, not just culture of transparency, but information publicity, uh, so that, um, you know, everyone can make great decisions and, and uh, uh, you know, bring sort of bring their bring their best to work. Okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, Naomi, uh, maybe uh, you have something in this area to, to share as well. Working yeah, with I, I, I want to just touch on a conversation we had a moment ago. I think that I think a lot of teams get confused between strategy and planning. And I think that a lot of companies do planning, but it's not necessarily strategic. And I think that sometimes it's because they don't have the data or they don't have the information or they're not thinking competitively, perhaps. I think a lot of startups see mm -hmm. themselves as the only person doing what they do. And, you know, they haven't, and that's sort of their, they're proud of that, um, but they're not really looking around to see where, you know, not necessarily a competition, but if someone were to give us money, where is that money being taken away from? That's your competition, right? So being strategic, I think, is not something a lot of businesses do. I think they plan and they think that's a strategic plan, but it's not necessarily strategy. So I think um, I think if you could if you could reduce the time it takes to build the reporting and to get the information and to have that accurate, you could probably spend more time being more strategic. 
So I think there's an issue there, at least at the board level, and we, we see that happening a lot. Yeah, I think that's actually a great point, and especially with, uh, I guess, scale-ups and all growth companies totally love it. In love is the product and everything else, you know, is not so important. But actually, most of those startups and scale-ups or growth companies then, then stop growing. Usually, the problem is actually not the product, but just everything else. Uh, sorry, that was I'd just be interested... Topic. I wonder if I could ask Naomi, I'd be interested in asking you what your opinion is on the balance between strategy and planning, because I, th I think you're right. A lot of people planning, they think it's strategy. Now, if, stra if you're doing strategy as often as you're doing planning, you're probably doing it wrong, I'm thinking. Um, what's the balance <laughs> and how often do you revisit the strategic part that you're planning towards? Yeah, I think I think a lot of that is going to be dependent on the business you're in at the time, the com the complexities, the challenges you're facing. Um, you know, if you'd asked a company that in 2020, it probably would be a different answer from what you get today. I don't think there's a hard and fast, true answer to it. I think it's dependent on the business. But I think that if you, if as a business, you don't see um, uh, strategic decisions being made, so whether it's, uh, you know, pricing decisions, um, strategic moves that you need to make that might give you the competitive edge or get you further along the line with a particular client versus a competitor. Um, those are the types of topics you should, those are the types of topics of conversations. Now, board directors, if I'm just focusing here on the board for now, but um, if board directors are meeting on a quarterly basis on a, on a regular year, right? I, I'll say COVID, they probably met a lot more frequently, but um, they're meeting on a quarterly basis, um, you know, that's sort of when that has to happen. Um, and so it's not often at the board level. It's, it's, and it doesn't necessarily tie in with the last quarter. Um, and I think, Ralph, you and I have talked about this before, where, right. you know, a quarterly board meeting, it's a, you've got to wait for another quarter in order to then have those conversations. It's, it's almost too long. And I think boards are having those conversations. You could take it in a different direction. They are talking about having more meetings more frequently, more like an agile type uh, setup where um, they have those conversations more frequently. So I, th I think, I think the, um, I think since COVID, some companies have actually changed their meeting structure and their meeting frequency. Um, and I think that's a positive thing, but I, I can't, you know, to answer your question, I can't. I, I don't know if I can give you a hard and fast rule for every single firm, but if they're having the quarterly meeting, that's kind of when it happens. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, if there are any uh, questions from the audience, uh, please uh, add it to uh, the chat room. Um, otherwise, I, I would ask, would like to ask uh, one more question to each of the panelists, since we only have uh, five minutes left to uh, sum up. I mean, what can uh, growth companies do to avoid being sidetracked and uh, to circle back to the subject of our panel? Measure, develop, apply, evolve, repeat, and actually build their IQ with this in mind. Can uh, you propose a few ideas or one that comes to mind as the most important one? Maybe to, to do it a quick round. Katya, maybe you want to go ahead? Sure. So if I think about the, the, first, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question, Ralph, is really investing in your employees. I mean, the adaptability, the flexibility, like Naomi said, you know, how often do you strategically plan? And then how, I mean, you execute on a daily basis, but your execution can only be as good as the individual employee executing um, down the track. And that really filters down from management to the warehouse workers of larger firms or, or the executive assistants or the middle management. And so there needs to be training appropriate <clears throat> Um, not only communicating the strategy, but also responding to the needs of these employees. And the needs right now are that these employees are struggling with uh, other um, very important life circumstances, being their mental health, their physical health. Um, and, and, and companies are really seeing this fact. So one advice that we like to give companies, and what we're seeing is a real trend right now, is companies in their employees um, from a well-being aspect as well as an upskilling aspect. Um, so there's a lot of restructuring happening. Companies have to stay agile and flexible to adapt to new changes, new environments, new circumstances. And so does do their employees. So upskilling, 
and investing in the well-being. Those would be my two recommendations for any board and for any CHRO and CEO. Sorry, Ralph, you're still on mute. Sorry, I said, uh, thank you very much. And uh, John, can you go next? I think the critical thing is to harness the genius. So the genius of the founders, the genius of those who have a strategic vision, the genius of genius is exploring the unknown. And that's what you need to do because that's where the treasure is. The Achilles heel of genius is ADHD. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. We could also do that. We could do that. We could do that. We can do everything, but we can't do everything if we're going to do something. And so getting that genius and then harnessing it and hoping that you're harnessing it on the right path. Awesome. Matt. Um, I think learning loops have to be built into basic business process. And, um, you know, as I say to people all the time, learn, learning is like fuel for the organization. And who runs out of gas because they're too busy driving around to start a gas station? Right. You don't. You, when the light's on, you stop at the gas station and you fuel up um, in, you know, in basic business process. If you're doing annual planning, not my wife. Yeah. <laughs> In, in business, right, you have a process for doing the budget every year. You have a process for doing quarterly goals. Step one in that process needs to be learning loops. What happened last time? What did we learn? How are we going to do it differently this time? Okay, now let's get, you know, get the business. But it, it's the foundation for basic business process. Excellent. Thank you. David? I'll take another perspective, which is that kind of how the organization is set up is is. is to me, like one of the most important things, we just hired a new head of human resources. And one of the reasons why she left her previous organization is she didn't have a seat at the table. She wasn't like part of the strategic planning process. She wasn't in all the leadership executive team meetings. She wasn't reporting directly into the CEO. And I think that person's job is to help to facilitate and represent the needs of the people and support the people. And if it's de you know, lower down in the organization, I think it's going to be a lot harder to be able to have it be a strategic than if you're in every leadership meeting and if you're really a, a business kind of partner and champion. So that would be my number one. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. And uh, now... Yeah, uh, I think just pretty really finally from me, I, I feel like the next couple of years are going to be critical to boards. I think if they've learned anything over COVID, it was that they were disconnected um, they didn't have the right information and they couldn't make decisions quickly. Um, and again, part of that is um, down to the reporting that comes to them, the information that's delivered, and especially on strategic advisory boards um, of startups and high growth phase companies, um, a lot of these individuals felt a little cut off from what was actually going on in the business. So I, I feel like the next couple of years are going to be critical. I think there can be major changes made to governance bylaws, um, and, and boards can really start to take um, a more active approach uh, to how they, they, you know, they lead and how they support the stakeholders and the shareholders of the business. So I, I think there's a lot coming and I think there's a lot of technology that's being developed, too. So I'm excited about uh, about about the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, maybe I just uh, conclude at this point. So they also uh, ran already uh, over a little. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, there seems to be a lot to do in general. And I guess the key drivers here uh, to get right, also to build a company's IQ, is really genius plus mission plus people plus system and plus methods. So um, I think uh, I'd like to uh, really thank everyone. It was a, a great panel, uh, very insightful. And for the audience, uh, please enjoy uh, the rest of the session at the Horace Summit. And uh, please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.